I'm Ryan, and here are some announcements. Today, from 4.30 to 6, there will be the Youth Super Bowl Party. Oh, Super Bowl Party, Super Bowl Party. Let's hear it for the Falcons. Let's hear it for the Patriots. Let's hear it for Jesus. Let's hear it for Doritos and Tostitos and Fritos and whatever else ends in Eatos. Oh, and burritos. <laughs> See you there. Next week during church, the youth will be selling Valentine roses and carnations. They will be raising money for their wilderness trip, so please bring cash to church! Did that sound convincing, guys? Yeah, it did. You're gonna buy some flowers now. Our last announcement is for the Center for Success. The Center is looking for people to specifically donate program supplies. Please pick up a list from the Connect Desk of what they need for February. Anything you donate, please drop off at the Connect Desk. Thank you so much! Mwah! And now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Ryan, Fun Facts! Wait. Most of the people watching this video right now probably have gone their entire lives without thinking about turkey eggs. This is Ryan signing off. You know what's next. Let's get pumped for the message. All right, man. All right, good morning again. It's so great to be here with you guys this morning, and I've got a message that I'm excited to preach. First off, I want to give a shout out to those watching on Facebook Live. Thank you so much for tuning in. There's a little link there if you want to know more about our church and want to uh, help us out financially as well. You can look at that. And then also this morning, guys, I need you to help me welcome someone who is watching us online. Um, this morning, you guys probably remember, but usually third or fourth row, a guy named Chris sits every week faithfully and shouts me down. Sometimes he tells me my shirts look too tight because <laughs> I like to eat. And so Chris uh, has been going through some health issues and has been in the hospital for over a month now. And uh, Elder Dave is sitting up a Marion General with him this morning and watching the live stream with him. So can we say good morning to Chris? Hey, Chris! Chris, we miss you. Get better soon, and uh, can't wait to have you back here to yell at me and tell me to get some bigger clothes. Love you, brother. All right, so this morning, if you've got your Bible, if you can turn to the book of Ezekiel, and we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 37 this morning. And this is one of those messages that I am speaking to myself and letting you listen. Is that Okay. I'm just preaching to myself and letting you guys in on it. So Ezekiel chapter 37, and we're going to read um, the first half of the chapter starting in verse 1. Uh, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and sent me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. 
And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them. They came to life and stood up to their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O my people. I am going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle in you and your, in, in your land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Look at the person next to you and say, he's done it. He's done it. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the story of Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. Lord, I pray this morning that it would not be by my might or by my power, but by your spirit, God, that I communicate what you've given me to this church, that it could encourage somebody this morning, that it would strengthen us as a body and strengthen us individually so that we can live the life that you have created us to live. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said, amen. This morning... I want to talk to us on the topic of can these bones live? Now, if you don't know Bible history at all, you're kind of going, what are you even talking about with bones? What is this whole point of this story? Where are you headed this morning? And so I want to explain to you about the prophet Ezekiel and where he's at in this place in his life. At this point in history, Ezekiel has come to a place where the Israelites have seen God do incredible, incredible things. This is the same people that have watched God part the Red Sea, the same people that have watched God take uh, uh, the, a little oil from, from a widow and, and flour and make it so it just continued to run over and over and over so that her not enough became more than enough. These are the same people that have watched God defeat the enemy right in front of their, their eyes by the way they even praised, like they didn't even have to fight and they just saw God win battles for them. They have seen God bring them out of Egypt where they were in slavery into the the promised land, which was a land flowing with milk and honey, which was a sign of abundance and prosperity. They have seen God do the miraculous. And now Ezekiel, who's a prophet to the people of Israel, is realizing something has happened with their faith. There's a funny thing about faith and fear. Faith cannot live in the same space as fear. And fear cannot live in the same space as faith. And so where there's faith, there's a deficit of fear. And where there's fear, there's a deficit of faith. And sometimes in our life, when we have been so full of faith and we have seen God do incredibly miraculous things and we've shared those stories and God has just been there and done things that we couldn't even imagine. Our faith was so great, but then we let fear step in. And when fear steps in, our faith is knocked to the side and we begin living from a place of fear. But faith can't dwell with fear However, concern can dwell with faith. It's one thing to say, I'm in faith, and so I can't be in fear because I'm in faith. But how many know if you had faith in your life at any time in your life, you can be having faith for everything, but there's still some things you might be concerned about? There might still be some things. I've got faith to believe that God will sustain me, but I'm a little concerned that if I don't take care of myself, I might die young. 
right? I've got faith to believe that God can come through and pay all my bills on time at the, before the end of the month, and it's going to be all good. But I'm a little concerned because right now it doesn't look like that, right? I got faith to believe that God is the ultimate healer, but right now in my life I'm a little concerned because I'm facing some things in my life that are telling me this disease is going to overtake me, Right? So faith and fear don't dwell together, but sometimes with your faith, you'll experience some concern, and what's beautiful about that concern is it's what turns you back to your faith. That concern comes to make you go, okay, God, only you can do this, only you can do this, and you begin to realize that what you're saying is the absolute truth. Only he can do it. And so fear would say God can't do it. Fear is doubt, right? Fear is confusion. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. A sound mind is wisdom. That wisdom will tell you, you might have some concerns, but you know that only God can do it. And so your faith and your fear can't exist together, but the concern you have while you're living in faith actually can drive you to see the impossible happen again in your life. And that's where we find the prophet Ezekiel. It's not that he doesn't have faith. It's not that he's lost his faith. It's that he has seen God do incredible things in the life of the Israelites for generations past. He's seen the miraculous happen, and he still believes God because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so this passage wouldn't even be here if Ezekiel wasn't listening to God when God gave him this vision. He wouldn't have been able to hear God if he wasn't listening to God. Can I say at the beginning this morning that maybe the reason you can't hear God is because you don't actually believe he'll speak to you? Maybe the reason you aren't hearing what you think you need to hear is because you're trying to put your faith in yourself and not in him. And so Ezekiel is in this place where he goes, all right, God, I still have a faith to believe that you can move mountains. I still believe you can part Red Seas. I still believe that you can set us free. But we're currently in captivity. We're currently dried up. We're currently at a place as a nation and as a people of God where it looks like it's over. Have you ever been in a place where you felt like it was really good then, but it looks like it's over right now? And so Ezekiel seeks God because he still has faith, even though he's concerned that it looks like it's over. And he goes before God, and God gives him this vision and puts him in this place of the valley of dry bones. Now, I was was studying this last night, and I was like, I wonder why it says the valley of dry bones and why God didn't just take him to a valley of bones. Well, because if you know how our bones are made in our body and how they continue, like, as, as we die. I don't know how to explain this right because I'm not a doctor, but I should get a doctor up here. But, okay, so, so the reality is if the bones are dry, they've been there a long time. Let's put it that way, right? This is not that Israel died yesterday and Ezekiel's like, God help. This is, this is like generations have gone on. In fact, in the book of Joshua, he talks about the fact that, 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 that for generations they worshiped God and they praised God and they gave their lives to God. And then in the, in the first chapter of Judges, in chapter 1, it says that a, that a generation went by, okay? One generation passed on to the next generation and they forgot the good things that God had done. And so God brought them into this promised land, and a generation later, they totally forgot what God had done. And so we find the Israelites in this place where they're just dried up, and they're just convinced that it is over. Those good old days were as good as it's going to get. Don't tell me your latter will be greater than your former, because my former was way better than what I'm living in right now. Anybody else, right? You, you want to say all this, your best and most blessed days are ahead of you? I don't know what you know, but in 2014, I made the most money I ever made. And 2016 was the least I ever made. My best days aren't in front of me. They were behind me. Right? How many times in our lives are we convincing ourselves that because of our present circumstance, we'll never get again to the place where we see God moving in our lives? And that's where we find Ezekiel. And so Ezekiel comes before God and God takes him to the place and he shows him these dry 
bones. And he says, Ezekiel, these dry bones represent Israel. These dry bones represent my people. I wonder in your life this morning what the dry bones are that you're facing. What are the things in your life right now that you even this week, all right, this week said, God, I don't actually believe that you're going to come through in this anymore. Because I, I know they're there because I did that this week. Right? I know there's things in my life. I haven't lost my faith. I will die for the gospel. I mean that. I believe in Jesus Christ as the son of God, coming first and coming king. I can't even quote the scriptures. It's all up here in head. But I know what I believe, right? And I'll stake my life on who he is, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega. I know what I believe, and my faith is still there. But I'm a bit concerned about some stuff going on in my life. And that concern is driving me to say, God, where then is my faith fully in you? And where in my life are these dry bones that even though I have faith, I've let my concern turn it into fear? Because if you use that concern to drive you towards fear and not towards faith, that's when the bones start driving, drying up in your life. And so the Israelites have let fear set in, and now the bones have dried, and they're going, it's over. We're done for. This is the end. What I love about God is it only takes one person to believe for him to transform a nation. One person. Abraham prays in the book of Genesis, and he's like, God, if there's but, you know, he goes on from like hundreds down to tens down to one righteous person. Would you save this nation? And God's like, absolutely. Why? Because God cares about you so much. God loves you so much that he if, he, if you were the only person in the world, he would still have done what he did for you. And he's like, I've got it for you. And so if there's just one, just one person, I could change the world through that one. And Ezekiel in this passage is that one. There's one person who has not let his, fa- his concern drive him to fear, but he's let his concern drive him to faith. And in so doing, allows God to give him this vision of this valley of dry bones and says, okay, God, what can you do? One person, what can you do? And I love what God says to Ezekiel. He looks at him and he says, so Ezekiel, can these bones live? Which is the stupidest question, Right? Does God know if the bones can live? Did God not create humanity and put the bones in the body? Like, how, does he, he knows the bones can live, but he looks at Ezekiel and he says, can these bones live? He asks Ezekiel the question because he wants him to know, Ezekiel, I've given you the authority to decide where your future's going. God is not going to push you anywhere. He'll put a desire in your heart. He'll give you a dream. He'll give you an idea. He'll he'll whisper something in you of what to do. But he's not going to push you there. It takes your faith and your confession to get yourself to the place that God has called you to go. And so he says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel goes, only you know. Which is a great Sunday school answer, right? Who died for your sins? Jesus. Right? Right? Like, like it's, it's, it's just a response. Well, God, only you know, because I'm, I'm a peon, and I know nothing, and I'm worthless in your presence. And, and God's like, you're, you're, t- you're convincing yourself that. I've given you the authority to determine whether this thing lives or not, and you're giving up because you think you can't do it. But when you actually know that I can do it, I'll use you to do it. You see, we like to say, okay, God knows. God's got it. God, he's got it. It's all in his hands. It's all in his hands, and I'm just going to sit here. Wait on God. 43 years later, I'm still waiting. The Lord told me he's going to give me this. Anybody else? He, he told me I'm going to be out of debt, so I'm just sitting here ordering pizza on my credit card, waiting. Okay, now my credit card's maxed, so I'm getting my kid's piggy bank. I need some pizza, waiting to be out of debt because God said I'm going to be out of debt. But God says, hey, I can do it all, but I want to partner with you to do this. And I put in you the power and the authority to see these bones live. And so the chapter goes on and Ezekiel says back to God, okay, tell me what to do. This is, my, my, this is the DJV. Tell me what to do. And God's like, all right, prophesy to these bones. Which is a weird thing if you're in the valley of dry bones, right? Typically, 
as a visionary. I'm, I'm wired as a very visionary person. And, and if I can get up, I've had opportunities to speak before crowds of thousands of people. And when I get in front of thousands of people, man, that vision comes out and I can declare the future. And it's amazing. But those Sundays when I started in ministry and 13 people showed up, I really didn't want to prophesy anything. I didn't want to talk about how good God was going to be and what he was calling us to do as a ministry because I'm looking around the room going, they can't pay for it, so why does it matter? You see, when we're dried up and we're in places where we don't have a lot of faith around us, it's not very easy to start speaking in faith. But that's the place God's like, that's where I want you. Because when everything in your life looks like it's falling apart, and it may very well be, that's when you begin to declare what I've told you and what you know the truth of who I am. And that's when situations start changing. And so he puts them in here and he says, you prophesy to this dead valley. And so Ezekiel prophesies to him. It doesn't exactly say what he tells them. He just says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. I don't know what he said. Come up the dried bones. Like, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know what he got up there to say. But he just did what God told him. Sometimes God won't give you the words to say. He'll just tell you what to do. And you got to just figure out what to say. But if you don't believe that God actually put in you the authority to have control over the situation, you're not going to have any idea what to say because you don't think you actually have it in you. And I think this is what happens to us as people that follow Jesus for a long time is we see God do so much incredible stuff. I've shared stories with you guys of things that that Kelsey and I have seen in our lives and houses given to us and vacations and God breaking through and and opening center for successes out our ears that we didn't pay for. It was like nuts time, right? Like God was so big and so gracious. And now it's January, February of 2017 and I'm sitting in meetings having to make decisions on how to cut back because we're broke. And it's really easy for me to remember back then and be like, well, I guess we just rode that out and it was good then, so God must have something else for me to do. Which I told him, if he's got something else, it's going to be on a beach. (laughs) I'm done with the Midwest. That's all I got to say, y'all. You can come with me, all right? If it don't work out, we go to Hawaii, minister to the seaweed people, whatever it takes, because I don't do cold. But anyways, so of course, so like next thing in my life, I'll be in Alaska or something. Let's not go there. Okay, so I love it here, Jesus. Thank you. Okay, so um, I really do love it here as in like the church, you know, like, okay, I'm just getting myself in trouble. Okay, so, but he looks at him and he says, you prophesy to them, regardless of what's going on in your life right now, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you don't see, and you speak my word into them. And so he does as he's commanded and he speaks it. We don't know what he says, but he speaks it. And then God comes back and he says, now breathe into them, which is so interesting because why do I have to breathe into the situation after I've already spoken to it? Isn't one time enough? But see, I think that's what we do sometimes. We're living off the prayers that our grandparents prayed for us, right? Someone spoke into my life that I was going to be a pastor when I was eight years old, and so I guess I'm going to be a pastor, and then things start getting bad, and I don't know what's going on, but I'm not running back to God because I'm like, well, it said it, and so God said it. I believe it. That's the end of it. Who grew up in church? You know that saying, right? What happens when God said it, you believe it, and it doesn't work out? He says, you got to breathe life back into those. It's not enough just to declare it. you got to put effort into it. Breathing takes what? You go, <gasps> like it takes effort on your part to continue. That was good. I know. Thank you, Caleb. But that takes effort on your part to continue breathing into your dreams when your dreams are crashing down around you. But he says, don't just speak, speak, and then breathe. And then when he breathed his breath, a vast army came to life. If you're taking notes this morning, there's a couple things I want you to write down. The first thing you can write down this morning is that you need to start prophesying life to every place that you see death in your life. Where do you see death in your life? We don't talk about death much, honestly. I don't like to, as a pastor, you don't hear me teach much about eternity, and and maybe that's, oh, thank you, Jesus, okay, conviction, but like, because I don't want to die, I'm just being real, can I be real? We're kind of real here, I'm sorry. Okay, so like, I don't want to, I love life, 
And I know John says, you know, not to love your life, you'll lose it. I, I get all that, okay? I'm not, not that. But I'm fulfilled in what I do. And I'm not like one of those guys that's like, man, I just wish I could die and get to heaven. I, no, I, there's, this is an adventure. I mean, there's, there's a world to change. There's a kingdom to build. There's nations to reach. I'm not ready to be done, right? And so because of that, I don't often talk about the dead things in my life. I just ignore them and act like they're not there. But what happens when I ignore them and act like they're not there is I actually gave into those things and gave into the fear of those things instead of bringing my faith into those circumstances. And so I'm like, okay, God, I'm just going to ignore that. I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to ignore that. But over here, this is so good. And God's like, no, I want you to walk back over to that thing and start speaking life back into that dead thing. What? But God, it's way easier to speak life into somewhere there's already life. It's way easier. I'm going to just be real, right? Ministry is hard. Being a pastor is, is hard. And I don't say that to, like, don't send me a card and flowers. I'm not, not that kind of hard. You know what I mean? But, like, but like it's, right, if you run nonprofits, right, Megan, like, there, there, there's a battle you face that a lot of people don't know about. But can I tell you this as someone who started a church before? It's much easier to pastor a church that was already in existence than it is to start one on your own. It's way easier. And I'm not like, man, my job's so easy. I'm not wanting to think that. But it's a totally different world because when, when something, you're trying to start something from nothing, it takes a whole lot more work than to just continue something that's already there. And so sometimes in our life, what we do is we focus on the things that are alive and we just keep breathing life into those things and this situation's really good and this relationship's really good. But in the same time, we're neglecting everything over here because we just don't want to walk up to it and talk to it. Because if we walk up and talk to it, we might actually have to do some work around it. And we don't like work. We'd rather sit and wait for our pizza on our credit card. Because God said, I'm going to be debt free. I'm, I'm preaching to me. So you, you're just listening. I'm glad it's working for you, sister, because it's working for me. It's working for me. All right. So begin to speak to the places you see death. Thank you, John, for joining me. Because you know I'll never stop if you don't start playing. All right because I'm preaching to myself. Speak where you see dead places. What are the dead places in your life? We don't talk about them, but what if we did? What if we got real enough with God to say, God, this marriage sucks. Oh, did I say that in church? I'm sorry. This marriage is, is failing. This marriage is, this marriage is not, it's not above reproach, Jesus. <laughs> I'm just trying to be spiritual. This marriage sucks, God. My finances suck. That conflict I've been dealing with over and over for 14 years, I'm done with this. God's like, yeah, so am I. So why don't you walk up to that situation and put your faith behind it and begin to prophesy life where you see death? Because I'm sick of hearing about it too. The problem is I put in you the authority to speak to that situation and you're waiting for me to come through. Walk up to where you see death and speak life over that situation. The second thing this morning you can write down is to breathe life into what you see happening. Because see, we look at it and we start speaking life and we're like, okay, so I tried that, right? Right? I know I use a lot of these illustrations because it's a battle in my life, and now i got a guitar player behind me who's a personal trainer, but I hate working out. Can I just be real? And so I go to the gym once, and it hurts. You know what I mean? You can't even wash your bald head. Now, some of you guys, it's easier to wash your hair because it's, like, down here. That's amazing. i got to reach all the way up here after I go to the gym. i got to shave this. <laughs> you know, like it kills. And so, and so I, I'm like, no, I spoke life into that. I'm going to be in shape. I worked out once this year. And then three weeks later, I get on the scale and I, why do I weigh more? I don't understand. It's not making sense, right? It doesn't make sense because I, I didn't stay consistent with it. I think breathing life is just staying consistent in what you believe God is doing. Speaking over and over, it takes breath to speak into that. I could go into, I won't because I don't have time this morning, but just the idea of breath. God breathed breath into us as humanity. And so we have blood in us, but the life in the blood is actually God's breath. 
So when you're breathing life into something, like God's like, I've got my breath in you. The reason you stay alive is because my breath is in you. And because I put my breath in you, Jesus says that we'll do greater things than he did. But maybe we're not seeing the greater things because we're waiting for him to do it. And he said, we'll do it. We'll do greater things than he did. So begin to breathe life into what you see happening. And the last one to write down, and then I got some things I just want to declare over us this morning, is to declare vision beyond your current circumstances. This one takes a lot of faith for me. Can I be real? So I told my wife last night what I was going to preach about and got scolded. Not really scolded. You guys, I make her sound mean. She's not, she's the sweetest thing. If you know her, you know. Kelsey's like a regal. She's a truth teller though. She, she won't let you act like you, you know. I don't know why I talk so ghetto. I'm a white boy from Michigan. But anyways, I just want to be. I just, I love it. Anyway, she, you know I do. You know, Brittany. Oh, I do. I hang out with Miss Annette too much. Yo. <laughs> But so Kelsey got home from work last night, and it's been a really hard week. Just in this next week coming up, I got some things I got to do that are even harder. Just being real. And I said, I'm going to get up there tomorrow, and I'm just going to share with the church all the hell I'm going through and let people know I relate. And Kelsey goes, what? I thought she'd be proud of me. I've been working on this message for four days. This is good. And she goes, you're just going to air all of our dirty laundry to everybody? I was like, yeah. Don't you want, you want to know, right? You can sympathize with me. And so she goes, how's that going to help anybody? And, I'm, and, and, and guys, I'm all about vulnerability and authenticity. That's why I share a lot of my own life. But a lot of the stuff we're going through would probably make you want to be depressed with us. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, who wants to come to church and leave like, oh, God, I hate my life. <laughs> like, that's... Like, God has entrusted me with this house to be the person over it that increases your faith. And here's the thing in ministry sometimes, we think pastors don't get sick. It's it's funny. I heard this illustration from Bishop T.D. Jakes, and he said, you know, I went to the doctor the other day, and my doctor had a cold. And I didn't go for a cold. I went for something else. And I'm like, my doctor's breathing on me, and I'm getting a cold. And he said, "I, I left going, that's interesting. My doctor's got all the degrees to get to being a doctor, is able to prescribe medicine to help me be healed, and the same thing that comes on me can come on my doctor. But for some reason, sometimes in ministry, we think with pastors, it's just different. Nothing ever happens in their lives. Everything's great, right? Just We just sit around at our house singing kumbaya, floating around on clouds, eating Philadelphia cream cheesecakes. Okay, that part's true, but not the clouds, but the... I'm just kidding. Just... I got a cheesecake. It's just... Ah, it's my coping mechanism. I ain't into drugs with cheesecake, folks. And it's probably worse. Anyway, so, but I, I kind of got irritated with my wife and just being real, all right? She knows this. And I was like, well, then I'm going to go upstairs in my office and I'm just going to sit and wait and see what God tells me to say. If you're telling me that's God, what I can say. So I went upstairs and I sat down in the office and I started listening to podcasts. I do that a lot. And I was listening to this pastor and he started, he wasn't preaching about Ezekiel, but in his message, he, he mentioned Ezekiel. And I was like, oh. Because Tuesday night, I was here for prayer service, and I was studying my Bible, actually Tuesday at noon, and I was reading stuff. And I've clearly heard God say, talk to the church about Ezekiel this week. But I went through so much hell in between Tuesday through now that I was not going to get up here and tell you to prophesy to your death. I'd rather talk about my death. I thought, this, it ain't working, God. So why am I going to get up and lie to people? And Kelsey goes, if it's truth, you're not lying. Just because you don't see it in your life right now does not mean it's not true about who you are and who God is. And so we have to begin to speak things so much greater than what we see currently in our life. Declare vision beyond your current circumstances. So here's what I'm going to do this morning. I wrote down some vision I'm going to declare over us, all right? I'm going to just say some things. If this resonates with you, do what you got to do. But I just wrote down what my hope is for us as the church and for you. I just, I felt like God said to me last night, what do you see? So here's what I see. I see a building filled with people every Sunday worshiping God and being filled up so they can be poured out each week. 
I see lives thriving, not barely getting by, not just making it, but thriving in every way. I see marriages and relationships restored and flourishing, not mediocre, not where it's fine, but relationships that are so filled with love and respect and admiration and adventure that you find fulfillment and flourishing in everyday life. I see a church that is debt free, all of us debt free, not because we're addicted to stuff and materialism, but that we're so filled up with generosity that it flows out of this place into the streets of our city. I see a building completely restored. That's a lot of money, folks. I mean the stone, the wood, the paint, the floors, the pews, the electrical. For the love of God, you should try to turn on the balcony lights. Dan Combs is still alive. We praise God every Sunday. Because if you are trying to turn the balcony lights on, you don't know if you're going to make it. New electrical, the parking lot fixed, the windows, the cement fixed, all of it beautiful and doing what this building was meant to do, reflecting the glory of God. I see all of you connected in tribes, building your lives spiritually in community with each other. I see the Center for Success impacting Marion and beyond with programs, not only here in our building, but in reaching into schools all over Grant County. I see a place for our youth group to call their own. Yeah. That's our youth pastor over there. A facility where they can invite their friends to and a place that is open through the week to hang out, play games, talk about Jesus, and grow together. I see a 24-7 prayer room open to the community where people can come at any hour to lay their needs down before God. I see hundreds of interns being raised up out of this church over the next 25 years and going to plant hundreds of churches all over the world. I see God's House Africa expanding their reach far beyond Zambia, but out into the bush and into cities and the jungles of Africa, reaching people with uncommon love. In all of it, I see the kingdom of God advancing. I see people responding to the love of Jesus and giving their lives for his. I see people empowered and healed and delivered and set free to live life the way Jesus died for them to have it. I see us living with more joy than we know what to do with and that joy flowing out of us into our community and a buzz being created by our church throughout Grant County. I see uncommon love blooming in Grant County and people coming from all walks of life to not just our church, but to the city and churches all over the city that are loving and accepting and living open-handedly to their neighbors. This is what I see. I could keep going because I'm a visionary and I love to talk about what I see. In fact, out in the foyer, there's a few of those handouts of just things that we call them uncommon confessions of things that we confess over our church. But typically you don't get up and declare what you see when you're living in the valley of dry bones. Until you open the word of God and you realize that's exactly where he wants you to be. God's like, here's the deal, church. I know it's a mess up in here. I know that some of your lives are falling apart because I talked to you throughout the week. I know, Chris, you're laying in that hospital bed and wanting to be here. And you've been there too long, bro. I know that you guys have faced things in your life that you thought if the person around me or behind me knows what I just went through, they wouldn't even want me here. And that's a lie. Because the thing you went through is probably going to help somebody else go through it when they're facing it. But my encouragement for us this morning as we close is this. Let's start speaking life where we see death. Let's start saying to those things in our life that are out of order, out of whack, and dead. Not just the things that are kind of okay, but the things that are dead. And begin to prophesy life in them with the authority and the breath that God has given us. So we can watch those dead things get up and come back to life by the power of what we confess. Will you do that? Can those bones live? So what are you going to do? You're just going to say yes? Or are you going to start confessing over dead places and watch God turn it around one situation at a time? Stand with me this morning, if you would. They can live. 
Those bones can live. But what God is saying is it's our choice. He's not going to make them live. We decide. We decide what we're going to believe for. And then God says, okay, I'll put that breath in you. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you for every person this morning under the sound of my voice. God, I don't know what every single one of them is going through, but I know what some are. And I know that some of those situations are really tough, God. But I thank you that you are in it with them. And I pray this morning, God, that you would turn our fear into faith and that you would take the places in our life where we're a little bit concerned and drive us towards faith and not fear. Drive us towards you and not away from you. And I pray this week in our lives that we would start speaking life into some dead places, God. That we would start speaking with authority and breathing life into situations that are dead. And that we would begin to get a vision greater than what we see. I pray, God, that just as I'm speaking a youth center for our church, Lord, and and transportation for our youth, and the Center for Success Flourishing, God, and this building restored in the natural, that is impossible. But you are the God of the impossible. And you said that we could do even greater things than you did and you have told us that we would confess with our mouth if we would say it God you said that we could move mountains and we could see situations change and I pray this week God that in and through our lives you would give us the strength to open up our mouth and begin to speak the life that we are called to live begin to speak to those dead places and see them come back to life and as that army arises God we will give give you all the glory. We'll give you all the honor. We won't look at ourselves and say, look what we did, but we'll say, look what God has done as we surrendered ourselves to you, believed for the impossible, and spoke life into death in our lives. And we believe you for great things, even this week in our lives, God. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Keep your hands together and thank God this morning.